This morning, we are actually beginning to wrap up this sermon series that we've been involved in for the last eight weeks, talking about how it is that God forms us and shapes us. What is the foundation that we build upon as God uses who he is, uses the Holy Spirit to help us become, as the Apostle Paul talked about, fully mature in Christ. We begin uh, this sermon series by looking at the letter of Colossians where Paul says, my greatest goal is to prepare you to be presented to Jesus Christ as fully mature disciples. And so that has been kind of what we have been talking about as we think about what is our identity? Who am I? How is it that we abide in the love of Jesus? How it is that our past impacts who we are today as well as impacts our future. Because as we think about how it is that God has formed us and shaped us, it ought to also encourage us and help us to think about how then do I live this fully formed life out in the world? How do I serve others? How do I, as we talked about last week, grow in godliness and see this as a process? It's not just a once and for all thing. How do I find faith in community, the importance of being with each other? But this morning, I wanna return back to a way in which God does form us that we, I think if we were all honest, could look back and say, though we did not like it, we are often formed through moments and times and seasons of suffering whether that's chronic pain, whether that's the loss of a loved one, whether that's a terminal illness, whether that's a sense of injustice and feeling as though you have no voice, no place, that no one knows you. We all know what it is to experience seasons and moments and times of suffering. And some of you perhaps this morning find yourself in that place. But what Scripture tells us again and again and again and what we're going to be considering this morning is that God is at work even in those times of suffering, even in those moments of deepest darkness. I'm sure you all remember the song Sound of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel, right? And it has that great line in there, which is, hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again, right? You all know that song. Do not just sit there. You had all this energy earlier this morning. I heard it. Hello, darkness, my old friend, right? You're like, yeah, but Paul, you're talking about suffering. We're supposed to be somber and quiet. But how many of us know that feeling? And at some point, Garfunkel was describing what the song, Sound of, song of Silence, Sound of Silence was all about. And he said, it is the lack of our ability to love and to communicate. And a part of that is sometimes feeling as though we are in the darkness. Now, I like to think that this theme of hello darkness, my old friend, is biblical and it's actually in the Bible. Y'all believe me on that? Because if you don't, I'm going to show it to you, all right? Because you're like, there's no way you're asking a question if you don't have an answer of it. So, so Psalm 88 is perhaps one of the darkest psalms that we have. Because typically the psalms end, they, they, they may begin in darkness, but they end on an upbeat note, that there's still faith. There is still a God who brings hope. There is still something or someone to live for. But Psalm 88 is very interesting because it begins on an upbeat note, even though the psalmist is lamenting and complaining. But then it ends with this. So if you wonder where Art Garfunkel or Paul Simon, whoever wrote the song, where they got the hello darkness, my old friend, it was not original to them. Verse 18 of Psalm 88 you have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. Who knew? The Bible is timeless, right? 
You have taken from me my closest companions, and darkness is now my only friend. And guess what? The psalm ends right there. Ugh, man, aren't you glad you came to church this morning? We're not going to end there this morning, but I do want to create that idea of saying we all know those moments, those times, those seasons where darkness was indeed our closest friend, when we felt as though we could not get out or make our way out of the darkness. But what we're going to read this morning is not Psalm 88. We're going to read Psalm 77. In Psalm 77, we're going to see three movements of that psalm. The psalm is going to begin in lament. So the first nine verses that we're going to take a look at in just a moment are words of lament. And let me make something very clear. Lament is different than complaint. Okay? We are good at complaining to God. The people of Israel were good at complaining to God. We read about that in poor Moses leading them to the promised land, right, and all of their complaints. But lament, let me put the complaints, complaining against God maligns the character of God. It does not take into account the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the steadfast love of God. But when we talk about lament, lament is prayer that is offered in the midst of suffering and sorrow that takes into account the character and the goodness and the steadfastness steadfastness of God. Lament is prayer in the meantime. I think N.T. Wright, I don't, I don't remember where I read that, but I love it. It's like lament is not the final prayer, but it is prayer in the meantime. It is the prayer that helps get us through. So Psalm 77, we're going to look at the first nine verses. It's going to move from lament. Then there's a pivot in verses 10 through 12. And then there is hope. So that's kind of the, the, the way we're going to work our way through this psalm. As you listen to the first nine verses, though, notice where the focus is. It begins on God, but very soon it comes back to me. Asaph, who writes this psalm, is having a pity party, okay? I, it's all about, you'll hear this word, I, 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 I. So here we go. Psalm 77, the first nine verses. The Psalm of Asaph, we read this. I cried out to God for help. I cried out for God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. Anybody count how many eyes are in that sentence right there? There is a lot because when you are in suffering and you are in sorrow and you are in darkness, it is very hard to get beyond yourself. He continues on. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he ever show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in, his ang- has he in anger withheld his compassion? Wow. How many of us have been at that place? You don't have to raise your hand on this. I'm guessing all of us probably. We know what it's like to be in this place where all we can think about and all that consumes us is a questioning of God, of Asa saying, I cannot even sleep. And I have to tell you, when I can't sleep, that annoys me. Like, right, that, like that's the one gift I feel like that God gives us is you get to close your eyes and you get to forget about everything for five or six hours or eight hours or however long it is that you sleep. But Asaph is so wounded and so hurt and so filled with so much suffering. He says, even, I, even, my, even sleep, 
does not come. And he said, all I experience is simply deafening silence. I cry out to God, God, are you really faithful? Do you really care? Do you really know me? Do you really see me? Do you really love me? And I just get nothing. And many of us here today know that feeling. Perhaps, as I said earlier, some today, that's even where you are as you sit or as you watch worship this morning. The silence of God. It's found in the Psalms as well. Psalm 83, verse one, we read this. O Lord, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O God. Speaking and praying into the silence and getting nothing in response. Many of you may be familiar with the work of Jerry Sitzer. He's a retired professor um, at Whitworth University. A number of years ago, Jerry lost his daughter and his wife and his mother in a tragic automobile accident with a drunk driver. He has spent his life writing and teaching about how do we manage our way through suffering. And I've always appreciated Jerry's work because I think He's walked through it, but now he is able to talk about it and to write about it. And Jerry had a series of blogs earlier this year where he talked about different aspects of suffering, including how do we deal with the silence of God? And so I've got a quote up here on the screen for you all to look at um, that he writes about. And he says, how we view and receive God's silence depends upon our willingness to enter into it, choosing to be silent too. Not complain, though we ever be right to. Not question God or shake our fist at God, though we could. Not flee or avoid or yield to distraction. Who knows? Our silence might help us to see that God is truly and mysteriously present even in sheer silence. And so what Sitzer is saying is sometimes you have to embrace the silence. Sometimes you have to sit in sackcloth and ashes and just wait. Wait like Elijah had to wait. Because remember, as Elijah was wondering, does anybody care? Is there anybody out there? There's all these dramatic things that happen to him, and he hears nothing but noise until there is the still, small voice. In the midst of the silence, he sits and he waits. And we know that, and we experience that. And the psalmist that we're reading this morning in Psalm 77 understands that. But then I can't leave you there, okay? Because if we're just sitting in our suffering, it means that God is not necessarily forming something out of that. The one thing that the Christian faith has to offer to to the world, to each of us sitting here, is that it is the faith that says even in the midst of suffering, there is redemption. We don't mind talking about suffering because we recognize that even in the midst of that, God does his redemptive work. We see that at the table. We see that at the cross of saying, look, though we don't like suffering, though no one goes looking for suffering, there is a greater sense that God says, but I am going to form you and I am going to make you and I'm going to work through your life even through the suffering that comes your way. And so Psalm 77 continues on looking at verses 10 through 12 because now we see the psalmist pivot. He places pause on the I statements and wondering if God is faithful and wondering if God is going to reject forever and wondering if God's love has vanished forever. And then we read in verse 10, then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand, and that's the powerful hand of God. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. 
the psalmist now begins to remember. He knows the misery that he is in. He knows the sleep that does not come. He knows that darkness is his closest friend, but then he begins to remember. And remembering is so important when it comes to the faithfulness of God. This table we will come to in just a little bit. What does Jesus say? Do this in remembrance. Remember. And when you hear the word remember in the scriptures, It is an active word. It is an active remembrance. It is not a passive thing. And so the psalmist says, here's what I'm going to do. Not only am I going to remember, he says, I will consider your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Because the psalmist remembers that he has to change his mindset. Because you and I are, guess what? We are really good at throwing pity parties. We are really good at wallowing in our suffering. Well, maybe you, I'm really good at doing that, okay? Maybe you all are better at that than me. But, but there is just a sense of like, I like to sit in my pool of pity, right? And just kick around and dig it up and dig up all the bad stuff that has happened and the suffering that I've seen, the suffering that I've had loved ones, you know, walk through with all that sort of stuff. But I have to remember that God is faithful and God is good. And though I do not fully understand, nor will I ever fully understand, the promise is this, is that God is with us. And so the psalmist remembers and he meditates and he reflects and says, God has been faithful. And then the last part of the psalm that we're gonna look at in just a moment, but I wanna wanna say something about it before I read it. And that is, it's fascinating to me what the psalmist remembers and where he places himself. Because he goes back in history. He goes back to the Exodus. He goes back to the days of Moses and Aaron when the people of Israel were enslaved for 400 years. You wanna talk about suffering. You wanna talk about dreams crushed. What would it be like to know that you are a chosen nation and that God has said, I am with you and I am with your descendants and I am with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am going to form a nation who will be a blessing to the world. And guess what? You are enslaved for 400 years. You have no rights, you have no name, you have no voice. All you do is the work of others. And generation after generation after generation, all that was, was suffering. But the psalmist remembers that story of what God had done and how God brought the people out of slavery and led them to the promised land. But not only does he do that, notice how he places himself in the story. How the import, notice the importance and the value of community. So we read this as we continue on, starting now at verse 13. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? And notice how the change in tone now. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, God, and the... And, The water saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. And I love this line. Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Asaph, the psalmist who writes this psalm, what has he done? All of a sudden he's like, I'm walking with the nation of Israel. I'm seeing the glory of God displayed, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire as God leads the nation of Israel. I'm watching God part the waters and helping the people of Israel walk across the dry land to the other side. And he's saying, I need to be in community 
I need to be a part of that grander narrative. I cannot do this alone. It's one of the most important things I think that Scripture teaches us is that we are not to suffer alone. We are given a community of believers. You think about the paralytic in Mark chapter 2. Y'all remember that story? Jesus is super popular. He's in the house. The crowd's all around him. The crowd in the gospel of Mark always gets in the way. If you read through the gospel of Mark carefully, time after time after time after time, the crowd is always in the way. They're always disrupting things. The paralytic wants to be healed, but guess what? He cannot be healed. He has suffered for who knows how long, and there's no way to get to Jesus unless if his friends get him there. We know how that story goes, right? They climb up on the roof, they get their buddy, they figure out some harness system. I have no idea how they did the technology of this way back in those days. I wouldn't be able to explain to you even if today how they would possibly do this. But all I know is this, his friends got him to Jesus. And he was healed and restored. And his suffering was ended. And he could not do it alone. The psalmist is saying, as we read this story, that when we suffer, we don't do it alone. We need others. We need to sit with others. That's why when Paul writes to the church at Galatia, he says, you are to bear one another's burdens. And in doing so, you fulfill the law of Christ. The psalmist begins to heal as he reminds himself that he belongs in a community of faith that he is a part of a community of faith. And the amazing thing is this, the God of the heavens, the God of eternity, the God who stands outside of time, guess what this God does? He steps into time. The one who is eternal, the one who is alpha and omega, beginning and end, first and last, what does this God do? He steps into time. And then we see the ultimate stepping into time when we look at the life of Jesus. The one who is likewise also eternal, the one who is with the Father from the very beginning, steps into time to say, I'm with you. I will carry you. I will look out for you. I will be with you. And to me, that is miraculous. That God says, I don't just create all of this and then take a step back and watch. God says, I'm going to watch and I'm going to be in your life. At the very end of the life of Moses, you all recall, he, he preaches a very long sermon 34 chapters, now 33 chapters actually, but so whenever you get nervous or worried, I just always point you back to Deuteronomy chapter one through 33, okay? But at the very end of his sermon, as he's recounting and looking at the tribes of Israel, he says this about God. He says, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you. So the God who is present and on the clouds in his majesty. And then this is the line I love, verse 27. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. What Moses is saying at the very end of his life is he's saying, look, I've known hardship. I've known suffering. I've known loss. But the one thing I can tell you is that underneath it all, whether you see it or not, are the everlasting arms of God that will hold you and carry you. Because when we are going to talk about suffering and we're going to be talking, when we talk about being formed by suffering, we must trust in those everlasting arms that will hold us and carry us 
no matter what comes our way. Now, our friend, the Apostle Paul, knew something about suffering. He knew what it was to be beaten. He knew what it was to be thrown in prison. He knew what it was to be accused inaccurately and justly. But he kept on preaching and teaching and saying, even in the midst of that, God is at work. 2 Corinthians, 4th chapter, Paul writes this in verses 7 through 10, describing his life in the midst of the suffering. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us, reminding us that we are all jars of clay. And then this line, or these lines, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Hard-pressed, persecuted, struck down, crushed. Paul writes this, but Paul lived it. And he knew that at the end of things, God would be glorified. And Paul knew that one day he would be with Jesus. But Paul, I think, offers us an important perspective on how we navigate suffering. I've heard it said like this. I don't know who said it or where I heard it or whatever, but I like the line. And they were talking about suffering, and they said, what you have to remember is you need to show people your scars and not your wounds. Let people see your scars. Don't show them your wounds. Because no one wants to see the wound because it's painful and it looks horrible. And the truth of that statement, I think, is this, is that when we are in the season of woundedness, we really don't know what to say or how to say it. When we are in the deepest darkness, when we are facing and seeing or hearing or hearing nothing and, and facing the silence of God, and we are feeling wounded, it's hard to know what to say. But the redemptive part of suffering says there comes a moment when those wounds begin to heal and they become the scars. Henry Nouwen talked about being the wounded healer. You see, our scars do tell a story. The suffering that we go through and continue to go through in the long run does tell a story. If we can gain the perspective of people like the Apostle Paul and just step back a little bit and wait, we begin to see how God has been at work. Show people your scars. Talk about your scars. Frederick Buechner has this, okay, I'm going off script right here, and I'm always, it's always dangerous when I go off script a little bit, so hopefully I can tell this story right. Buechner has this great, this great, this, this amazing understanding of suffering that I've never, ever seen before, um, and so hopefully as I tell this story, I'll remember, I'll, 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 do, I'll do it justice. Um, he talks about the parable uh, that Jesus tells, and the guy gets, you know, like five bags of gold, and the other guy gets two bags of gold, and the other guy gets one bag of gold. Is that, that's how the story goes, right? All right, just making sure you all are with me. That's the only part I'm going to get right about this whole illustration that I'm going to do. Anyway, he, he takes that and he says, look, I want to think about that story through the lens of suffering. I don't want to think about it in like, how, you know, like investing in it, making more and more money. He says, I want to think about that story through the lens of suffering. Because what happens for the one who is going to suffer, they, they, they do something with that. They invest it. They show it to others. They help others to see that even in the midst of that, that there, there's something gained 
not only for that person who's telling the story, but probably for something else, somebody else because they're taking that suffering that they have gone through and they're investing in the world as opposed to the one person who gets the one bag of gold and what do they do? They bury it. They sit on their suffering. They sit in their suffering. They wallow in their pool of pity and do nothing with it and it eats them up. I think that's what Beekner's getting at. He's saying you've got to be a good steward of even your suffering. Not that I like that, but I think he's right. Okay, back to my sermon. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Does that, make, does that kind of make sense? Like steward your suffering well? Like I think, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, in the end, here's the deal. There's no great answer for suffering. And it doesn't mean we are, O ye of little faith, as Jesus would say. It just means there's no great answer. Theologians have written about it. Biblical scholars have written about it. And I love this line that Jerry Sitzer had in one of his articles. And he said, look, answers, good answers, great answers, well-crafted answers. The reason why there's no answer to the question of suffering is this. Answers will not rescue you. That's what's not going to rescue you. The only thing that will rescue you in the midst of your suffering is Jesus, is your faith. And thus we walk by faith and not by sight. I can't tell you why there's suffering. But what I can tell you is this that the cross behind me and the table in front of me remind us that Jesus says, I'm with you. I know what it is to suffer. I know what it is to lose my life. And to me, that's where I cling and where I land. There is no answer that will truly satisfy other than Jesus. And this Jesus wants to take what we have walked through and continue to walk through and use that to form us. He showed the disciples the scars. He said, I'm with you. And he says the same to you today. I said this several weeks ago. I say it again. God sees you, God knows you, God loves you. Pray with me. God, walking through the darkness, facing the darkness, facing the silence is never easy. And ultimately, we know there are no great answers. But what we do know is when we look at the cross, we see redemption and suffering. When we look at this table, we see a reminder. It helps us to remember what you have done for us through Jesus. So God, as we gather around this table, may we yield our hearts to you. May we recognize that in Jesus we meet the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, would you forgive us of our sinfulness, wash away the things that hold us back, help us to be faithful disciples, Help us to steward our suffering in a way that is glorifying and honoring to you. Feed us and restore us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.